Hello and welcome to Distillations, the science, culture and history podcast. I'm Michal Meyer, a historian of science and editor of Distillations magazine here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. Today we're looking back at our past year and I noticed that we spent a lot of time thinking about health and medicine. A few themes kept emerging and, and one big one was how outsiders have changed the various fields. Take the entire field of bioethics. The field itself started only in the 1960s in the United States and it was mostly started by philosophers, not actual doctors. But today, bioethicists influence medical practices because decades ago, they pointed out that medicine wasn't doing enough to think about patients' needs. Sometimes outsiders come from very unexpected places, like out of religion. We learned how Jehovah's Witnesses have long refused blood transfusions and yet still wanted medical care. Partly because of them, an entire field of bloodless medicine has flourished. And it turns out, in many ways, it's better for everyone. This and more in this special episode on Outsiders versus Insiders in Medicine and Health. Stay tuned. Our producer, Mariel Carr, is also joining us for the journey so she can share some of her reactions. Good to have you with us, Muriel. It's nice to be on this side of the microphone. We did a show on sex and gender, and we learned that there has been a long history of people being rejected who don't fit into traditional gender roles or who may be intersex. Just listen to this discovery historian of medicine Alice Strager made. She noticed something strange when she was in a room full of intersex people. Their teeth were in really bad shape. She asked the founder of the Intersex Society of America for an answer. So I asked her what was going on, and I knew biologically there shouldn't be a reason why so many of them had bad teeth. And what she explained to me was that they wouldn't go near anybody in a white coat, and that included dentists. And I remember being really shocked by that. Like, who would who would avoid people who are you're committed to being helpful and to making you more healthy. I avoid dentists. Well, that's a different story. But, you know, I, it made a whole bunch of sense to me after hearing the history and of the treatment of intersex patients and, and how the medical profession has looked down on them for so long. And I think that one thing that was really surprising and interesting that Alice talked about with the history of intersex patients is that they were told that how they came into this world was wrong, that there was something that needed to be changed. And so we, we learned and saw that, you know, our cultural ideas of how human beings are supposed to be does not necessarily line up with how nature makes people all the time. And you can just imagine the, the sort of trauma of going through that and hearing like you are, there's something wrong about you. Nature made a mistake. Well, it's also a, a very strong statement about the power of expectations, isn't it? I mean, if, if you look like a man, you're expected to be a man. And if you look like a woman, you're expected to be a woman by, by everyone who looks at you. Right? But if you're somewhere in between. Yeah, well, or if you don't feel like you look, uh, then, then it's a real problem. So, Mario, for example... In our feature story, you profiled a transgender man who defied expectations and prejudice and conceived a child with his partner, a transgender woman. Yeah, and I think what was really interesting to me about this story is that it seemed all about how science has outpaced cultural norms, that things that are scientifically and medically possible, some people, even including doctors, are simply not ready for. And I thought this line of Tina's, which we're about to play, really sums that up, where she's confronting a stranger on the street who is very vocally horrified to see her partner, Junior, a trans man, with his nine-month pregnant belly. We were coming out of one of the baby stores and two women, and I think we were maybe a few feet in front of them. And they were like looking and laughing and saying something and whatever. And I turned around and said, yes, it's a pregnant man. Catch up with the times, people. And so Junior and Tina were, they also had negative interactions with the medical profession. They were turned away from the first fertility doctor they saw. Uh, She told them that they'd never be able to conceive, but the couple wonders if she just wasn't willing to try something that 
seemed outlandish or that she'd never done before. Or maybe she was uncomfortable with their unconventional gender identities and bodies. But they believed her. She was a a doctor, a person of authority. They believed her. And so they spent the next few years childless thinking they'd never get pregnant. Luckily, they finally found a doctor, Dr. Jacqueline Gutman, who was happy to work with them and really just saw the whole thing as a very straightforward scientific process. You know, no cultural biases involved. Ultimately, there are only so many ways a pregnancy can be achieved. And at this point in time, you need eggs, you need sperm, you need a uterus, and you need to make that all come together. And so they wound up having a healthy baby and they had a great experience with that doctor. But that first experience with the original fertility doctor really affected them and changed how they saw just doctors in general, which made them less trustful. And it was just, it was very similar to the patients that Alice Drager talked about. So the fact that she was able to just treat it scientifically or treat it biologically uh, and see what happened uh, is a real bonus, if you please, and quite different from the way most of the medical profession would view it, as, as we learned. I think something that is important to note, you know, even though people like Junior and Tina continue having negative experiences, the fact that they're having these experiences is actually changing the way that the medical system works. And there are, you know, new guidelines being written and implemented and slowly. And I think even doctors like Dr. Jacqueline Gutman think, you know, it is changing. It it is getting better. So I think people have to sort of suffer through it, but they are also helping implement change, which is a, a good thing. Staying on the topic of medicine, we did a show where we talked to bioethicist Art Kaplan, and he told us about the dawn of bioethics and why a philosopher like himself gets to tell doctors what to do. Medicine needed some help. They got too technical, too narrow, and they needed to keep the human side of medicine going, and they were getting ethical dilemmas. What I found fascinating in that show is that, I mean, doctors are trained to physically look after people. But at the same time, they're not necessarily dealing with the people, they're dealing with the people's problems. And the philosophers, I think, came in and said, hey, wait a minute, you also have to consider people's own ideas, people's own beliefs, people's own desires. It's not just the biological problem that you're dealing with. You're dealing with a whole person. And doctors sort of knew that uh, before because they'd refer to things like bedside manner and, and, you know, they're treating people, not just biology problems or, or medical problems. And, and if you talk too clinically or you talk too scientifically to a patient, you may scare them to death. So you have to have this bedside manner that comforts people and deals with their humanity. But our show pointed out and really struck me is just how much further beyond bedside manner this has to go. I think also... It seems like from what Art was talking about that bioethicists really helped not just think about, you know, how doctors are treating individual patients, but really like looking at the big picture. Like what is, you know, you're thinking about the very sort of practical, technical, medical, scientific things, but what does this mean for all of humanity? What, do, what does it mean that we can do these things? Should we do these things like organ transplants, for instance, or, or we should just think about how we do them? because they have broader implications. Yes, and certainly with things like genetic engineering, uh, when it comes to human beings, there are huge medical issues. And of course, things that can technically be done, it it may be that they should be done or perhaps should not be done. And and I think that's where philosophers really have a, a mediating role to play between, I would say, even the researchers, the medical researchers and, and the public. And philosophers can be surprisingly practical sometimes. I was impressed with one suggestion that Art made that I think would, should be pretty easy to implement and would help a lot of people. We now have a system that says opt-in. If you want to do this, you carry a card, you sign up when you go to motor vehicles, which, by the way, I have to say, may not be the ultimately wonderful place to make decisions about organ donation other than the fact that at motor vehicles you may wait there long enough to die there, in which case they can probably get your organs. But um, you still are opting in. You're making some positive uh, step to do it, and folks don't necessarily want to do that, or if they do it, they don't tell their other family members. In any event, I think we might move to an opt-out system. We continued thinking about medicine and science and ethics and people in our next show about blood, 
medicine and religion. Alex Ashley's feature story explored how Jehovah's Witnesses' unique views on blood transfusions, that is, they refuse them completely, has actually changed the way doctors practice medicine. Here's one Jehovah's Witness patient he talked to. Well, years ago, I remember when I was going to have an operation when they used to give you a shot to kind of relax you. This is Jack, the football player again. Um, I had a doctor come up to me after I had my shot and he asked me, so if you're going to, if, if you're on the table and it's a matter of life and death, um, you don't want a blood transfusion. Is that what you're telling me? And I just looked him in the eyes and I says, that's right. Do your best. Um, and if, but if you can't uh, help me, just let me go. So one transplant surgeon that Alex Ashley spoke to said, religion's making an entire field of science question the validity of their beliefs. Because of Jehovah's Witnesses, more doctors are approaching all patients with the idea that they shouldn't transfuse unless they have to. That's been very rewarding in that sense, that, that there is an approach that can be um, not just modified. I mean, it's really just an approach that can be applied in a different environment completely. Every patient who comes to the door should be a candidate for, for blood conservation surgery. We were surprised by the fact that this non-medical outside group had such an influence on medicine. Then we talked to Jacqueline Duffin, a hematologist and historian of medicine. She made us think about the entire field a little bit differently. Wow, did she ever. I mean, her, her view of what blood is really, really changed my thinking. She talked about uh, what, a messy, what a messy field uh, hematology is because blood isn't this nice, pristine uh, liquid that we all tend to think of it as, you know, and, and, and we've put blood up on a pedestal as like the creator of life and things like that. And then she described it as, as this fluid that contains all kinds of microorganisms that sometimes does this and sometimes does that. And, and, and didn't she say blood is dirty? Blood is not clean. Blood is an organic substance that comes from human beings. And we are crawling with viruses and germs. As a result, blood will never be perfectly free of infection. And every hematologist and, and many other doctors are aware that blood could end up being infected with the next latest greatest virus. There's something very helpful in bringing in an outsider sometimes, just to give you a different perspective. And of course, a lot of this show is about knowledge and medical knowledge. And if you know it, generally you'll be the insider. So being the insider, you're the expert. And I think also for the insider, it's useful to have a reality check, particularly when it comes to other people's experiences. And how, do, how does society advance? You know, what, what do we call progress? You know? When I think over my lifetime, longer than any of the rest of you, maybe longer than all of you put together, uh, there's an enormous change from the beginning to the present day of my life. Yeah, and it doesn't just happen easily. It happens with struggle. And perhaps not always, change doesn't always succeed. So, Mariel, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. For Distillations, I'm Michal Meyer. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.